Good day, viewers. Welcome to a new edition of 30 Minutes, the interactive program of Trust Television with me, Manir Dan Ali. Our guest today is the Federal Minister in Charge of the Foreign Affairs Ministry of Nigeria. I'm talking of Ambassador Yusuf Abubakar Tugar. Ambassador, welcome to the program. Pleasure to be here. I believe the last few days have been a bit frenetic. There have been the ECOWAS uh, summit, and the big issue is Niger. Where are we now? Because it appears as if Nigeria and ECOWAS have been forced to a climb down from your initial position. Well, I wouldn't exactly put it that way. Uh, you have to bear in mind that the primary... Uh, or should I say raison d'etat, the reason for the creation of uh, ECOWAS is regional integration, uh, regional harmony, uh, peace, and uh, the general security of the region. So uh, ECOWAS is always looking to do what is required to bring that about. So um, what has transpired with regards to Niger uh, is simply uh, to take pragmatic steps towards, once again, uh, uh, a resolution of the current situation there. So The operative word there seems to be pragmatic. You have been mm. realistic. You are now kind of forced to recognize the new military government in Niger because you are talking of sending mediators, people who will engage with them, that the presidents of Togo, Benin, and one other. So uh, why did ECOWAS have to eat the humble pie, so to say, to now kowtow <laughs> with the Nigerian military rulers? It's not a matter of eating humble pie or kowtowing. It is, uh, again, a matter of pragmatism. So what transpired uh, immediately after uh, President Bazoum uh, was uh, accosted was uh, pragmatic as well. ECOWAS, the leaders of ECOWAS got together and they took certain measures. Uh, they uh, demanded for his release. Uh, they demanded that he continue as president. They imposed sanctions. And uh, of course, the fact that they mentioned as a last resort that the use of force was not ruled out, was blown out of proportion. Uh, of course, uh, there's so many, you know, um, interests uh, within. Uh, some misinterpreted that to mean that uh, Nigeria in particular was about to declare war on Niger, and the whole thing was blown out of proportion. But so these, are, these are measures, and you have to bear in mind that it's not, we're not talking about one country. We're talking about uh, several countries. So, Is this particular incident a sort of learning curve for you and for the administration? Because we are just a few months old when this happened and it appeared like a hot potato that you are looking for ways to get rid of. It's uh, the nature of uh, life as a whole. We're always learning, but uh, I wouldn't put it uh, exactly like you did because the decision was not uh, a unilateral decision by Nigeria. It was a collective decision of ECOWAS. But some were saying that it's like ECOWAS and Nigeria were trying to do the bidding of maybe the French, the US, and all those international do-gooders who wouldn't put their troops on the line. When have you ever seen Nigeria do uh, the bidding of an external um, uh, power. This Probably is a, this, this particular is, this instance. Is, this, is, this is a country, no. <laughs> this is a country, if you look, look at it, you can't even try to do that. You see, government is not, um, is not exclusive of the rest of a country. So when you're talking about foreign policy, it's a completely different uh, uh, area. Foreign policy is formulated based on uh, an aggregation of the position of, of a country. And it is not 
limited to the leader at the time. It's not limited to the government, but the country as a whole, the nation as a whole. So you're talking about interest groups, you're talking about um, uh, scholars, you're talking about uh, even uh, the populace and, you know, uh, business uh, community and so on and so forth. So um, let's not reduce it to just an individual or to just a government. So the, I don't see the connection. This, this is just, you know, playing into the hands of, of the propagandists that decided in order uh, to remain in power, in order to sustain themselves, uh, to label anybody. You know, it was a manichaean approach. If you're not supporting what we did, then you're yeah, doing the bidding of France. And, uh, and Nigeria has never been that way. You're talking about a nation that nationalized Shell. You and I are old enough to remember but are Shell, British Petroleum. This administration is better known for Are we not the same people? Is Was my worldview, I'm foreign minister, was my worldview not formed by growing up during that period when all of this took place? Certainly it may so, so then I will go through all of that in life and then wake up one day and then I will start taking orders from France. That does not make sense. That is pure propaganda. And it was just uh, most unfortunate that uh, uh, certain uh, sections of the country and, uh, and even media uh, um, played into that. So know? is it more charitable to say that the administration and yourself and ECOWAS we are now influenced by the feeling, especially in northern Nigeria, who, I mean, whose communities share a lot with the Nigerians, that now kind of shaped your reconsideration so that now you are talking of engaging with the regime. You are no longer talking of uh, Bazoum, the former president, being taken back into power. No, I think you have to that. read the, uh, the ECOWAS communique. ECOWAS communique on Niger, number one, says Bazoum must be released. In fact, not just Bazoum, his family and his associates. But it was silent on him being president of Niger again. Yeah, because, you know, that once, you know, uh, time having lapsed, like I said, you know, ECOWAS is being pragmatic. Time has lapsed. And uh, in order to diffuse the tension in the, you know, the prevailing situation, uh, ECOWAS is not insisting that Bazoum has to be returned, you know, it's being pragmatic. So if that you want to reduce it to that, yes, ECOWAS has changed position on that. But ECOWAS has not changed his position on saying Bazoum and his, in fact, his family and his associates must be released. ECOWAS has not uh, changed his, his position on saying that unless that happens, the sanctions will not uh, be removed, so sanctions remain until that has been uh, done. Uh, the issue of a transition, that is also still on the table. And then, finally, ECOWAS is also saying that unless all of these things happen, it is not ruling out the use of force. So even the ruling rule of uh, the use of force that, is, that, still that, on the table. is still on the table. So, you know, don't think that, uh, you know, ECOWAS has all of a sudden woken up and uh, that uh, certain people that were playing to the gallery, that were willing to, um, you know, maybe improve their political standing and some uh, that were also, you know, in opposition in Nigeria and some maybe that were even be being influenced by external forces, you know. The same external forces that, uh, you know, they are yeah, claiming that France, that, you know. So each person has had its, its own, uh, their, their own reason for, for doing that. And some simply just wanted to engage in selfie di uh, uh, diplomacy, to go and take pictures with Shani and some other people and then come back here and play to the gallery. Let's leave all of that aside. What we're looking for is peace. Uh, we uh, have always maintained a very close and friendly relation with Niger. We're not in conflict with the people of Niger. In fact, we're doing this for the people of Niger. This is why 
uh, Nigerian ECOWAS took this position. And so you, how do you, you have to separate, how? you have to separate uh, uh, the, the actions and the, uh, uh, and the, um, and the, the positions taken by a junta from that of the Nigerian populace. Let's not conflict issues. So with this hardline position, it is How not a hardline position. A resolution it is not a hardline problem. It is not a hardline position. It's a pragmatic position, and I don't know if you've uh, been listening to the responses. And this is something that we've been saying to the uh, Nigerian junta all along. But they are saying, in fact, they specifically say that people like you, the Nigerian foreign minister, and others are the ones blocking any resolution of the problem. Because the position they took was that unless you are going to acquiesce to what they want, which is simply remove the sanctions and then they decide how long they're going to stay and Bazoum, whatever happens to him and his children, including young kids, forget it. They don't care. And what we were saying to them is let us be pragmatic. Remove, uh, release Bazoum and his family. When and then we start removing the sanctions. When and tell us how long you're, you're, you're prepared to stay. But they were not prepared to do that because the very same people that were uh, playing uh, this game with them within Nigeria and outside of Nigeria were giving them hope that they can pick and choose who to engage either within Nigeria, even within the Nigerian government, and that there was hope that they could bring pressure to bear inside Nigeria to compel the government to change its position and to compel ECOWAS to change its position because President Bola Ahmed Tinubu happens to be leading ECOWAS at this, at this time. So it's a, it was a very dangerous game, and it was a very dangerous game for Nigeria itself. So they, now, were, they, were, they were offering money. They were, prepared, where, where, they were offering money. But Niger is people. a very poor country. Where is it getting money? I mean, many Western countries have closed the tap, stopped aid, and all sorts of things. So I if it's should, money, I isn't should, it Nigeria that's should, that I think you should money? direct that, that question to them. Because I cannot speak uh, on their behalf. But certainly, we have proof, concrete proof, that they were offering money to people, there were certain people uh, in Niger that were offering money to people here uh, to agitate for the removal of sanctions, to put pressure, in fact, was the, the words that they were using, to put pressure on, 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 on the Nigerian government to compel ECOWAS to remove the sanctions. And this, pr this, this move uh, was, uh, was, 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 you know, the pressure was being increased ahead of the ECOWAS summit. So this, this is no joke. Okay, now that the summit has held and these heads of states have been, the three, have been nominated to go and engage, when is that engagement going to begin? Oh, right away. It's already started. It started? Yes. They've gone and to Niger and sat with the military rulers? Well, I can't uh, disclose too much uh, information on that because, you see, part of the problem, again, why negotiations uh, did not succeed um, when we made certain attempts was because everything was being reported in media and social media. And, uh, but maybe it's the fact of life now uh, in the 24-7 no, kind no, of society no, 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 it's where not. very few things are hidden. Uh, no, it's not. I'm sure, you know, when you're at home uh, in bed and you're snoring, that is not being reported in, uh, in daily trust. So there are a lot of things, a lot of the activities. In fact, your life, I think maybe 80% of what happens is not reported and you're even a reporter. Thank you very much for that, and I will expect we'll continue the discussion on Niger after this short break. Viewers, it is 30 minutes, the interactive program of Trust Television, and our guest today is the Nigerian Minister of Foreign Affairs, Ambassador Yusuf Abubakar Tuga. Welcome back. 
If you've just joined us, it is 30 minutes, the interactive program of Trust Television, and our guest today is the Foreign Minister of Foreign Affairs Minister of Nigeria, Ambassador Yusuf Abubakar Tuga. Before we went on break, you were emphasizing the issues at hand over this Nigerian, I mean, Nigerian versus ECOWAS and Nigerian issue. How do you see, especially the relationship between the age old relationship between Nigeria and Niger after this may have passed? Because it appears that we have been robbing each other the wrong way, or at least at the level of government, maybe not at the level of communities. Exactly. It's good you, you made that differentiation. I think it will continue uh, to be good relations between Nigeria and Niger because uh, the overwhelming majority of uh, Nigerians, and not just in the northern part of Nigeria, all over Nigeria, and indeed uh, all over Niger, uh, have uh, they, they have a close uh, affinity and uh, they've always supported each other on the global stage in international organizations uh, with the trade um, uh, across our borders uh, cultural affinity all of that makes it uh, um, almost impossible for us not to get along with each other so let's and uh, you know it's 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 the nature of um, of uh, of life of um, of uh, neighborliness sometimes of of being uh, from one family sometimes siblings don't get along with each other they have uh, disputes they have disagreements but you know uh, they continue to uh, to be siblings and look out for each other and we'll continue to do that with Niger. Your government inherited a lot of closed borders not just with Niger but with other neighboring countries. Is this your government intention to review this because you are talking of improving the economy and then you have shut borders that are very useful for inter-African and neighborly trade. Is this something that you are considering looking at again? Well, that uh, I think has uh, long uh, pass because uh, I think one of the uh, early visits, early trips that I took as foreign minister was to go to Kotonu uh, for a meeting of the Abidjan uh, Lagos corridor. You know, and it, in fact, that's why I said, you know, it's important that we look at the entire communique uh, issued by ECOWAS uh, after the summit. If you read it, you will see that the Abidjan uh, Lagos um, corridor was mentioned there. The fact that there was a meeting, there were agreements, we're talking about uh, removal of uh, tariffs and uh, you know, uh, different uh, measures uh, to be taken to ensure that trade and movement of goods, services, people uh, is seamless across the border. So in other words, you are saying the border now between Nigeria and Benin is all open. There is no restriction. There are certain checkpoints, but we're actually even working on removing uh, those checkpoints. Along what the about way. those with Cameroon and Chad? Those are countries also bordering Nigeria from other planks. We are equally working on that, but our primary um, focus, of course, for now is ECOWAS resolving the issues since we have a regional economic community we want it to function uh, properly uh, which is not to say that we're not uh, working on 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 the others but you know the em em focus and emphasis particularly also because of uh, 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 the issues that uh, have been coming up within within ECOWAS so we want that and we don't forget that we're working on the ECO the, uh, yeah. the common currency. We've been we're, talking about it for working, decades and it has been push, pushed uh, ahead. Well, we're we not going but, to also kick it down the road. Uh, we, you, can, uh, you can see that uh, from the communique, if you read it, you'll see that uh, certain measures have been taken. We're talking about the customs union. That is also another issue. But, you know, you cannot do all of this. You can't achieve all of this without peace and security in the region. Uh, 
the terrorist activities, you know, you can see that some of the countries that are under um, military regimes uh, with uh, soldiers recently taken over, like uh, yeah. Burkina Faso. Burkina Faso is only controlling about uh, 30 to 40 percent of its uh, territory. The rest of it is in the hands of uh, non-state actors. So it's difficult to um, establish a common currency, a customs union, uh, if you have these sort of situations. And that is why we are standing firmly against military uh, takeovers and, uh, and dictatorships. What about another non-African countries that a lot of Nigerians are interested in going or in trading with? That's mm -hmm. the United Arab Emirates. There, were, there was an announcement some month back that President Tinubu has cracked the nut of visa, but it turned out not to be exactly true. Where are we on that? When can ordinary Nigerians expect a resumption of that particular visa issuance? It's, uh, you see, it's a process. So sometimes uh, when you meet and you agree that, yes, we have both agreed to resolve a problem, but there are certain steps that have to be taken. So uh, in trying to um, engage again with media and social media, even though you say everything is reported, this is what uh, what happened there. Without, you know, um, but it was a presidential the, statement that uh, well, raised the hope. It was the president's uh, spokesman who issued a statement saying the president has solved this problem that has been nagging people for too well, long. Well, uh, maybe there was a misinterpretation or misunderstanding of what uh, was be, what he was trying to communicate. But so, the issue here is yes. that. Uh, there was a, an agreement to work on this and there are steps to be taken before finally uh, having the visas being issued. And incidentally, visas are still being issued. It's not that there is no Nigerian whatsoever that is allowed. Of course, that I mean, to, over a thousand so Nigerians we were at the COP meeting in uh, Dubai. Yes, and then is, again, the media jumped the gun and said, oh, look, uh, the Nigerian government has taken over a thousand people. No, you know yourself. Yes, but the Nigerian you can go government online. came out you to can say four hundred plus people from Nigeria went in an age when many people join meetings via Zoom. You can go online. Yeah, sometimes you know these meetings require uh, the physical presence of uh, the actors because they're negotiations. You know, and uh, I don't know that Zoom is the most secure. Uh, means of, uh, of, 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 uh, of negotiating, you know, uh, you, you don't know who's listening. So sometimes you have to go physically to engage, but that is not even uh, a decision of the Nigerian government. You have a lot of civil society organizations, you've got media, you've got... Uh, uh, well, but they are not part of the that, 400 plus that no, the no, no, but that it wasn't admitted. It wasn't 400 that was reported. No, it, it was, was 1,000 over, over 1, 1,000 yes. from Nigeria. So we, but why, the yes. government said over 400, 448 or so okay. were from government, I mean, were funded by government coffers so, at a time when many Nigerians cannot eat. So which, which, which government? Because even governors were there. Do they not have a right to sponsor people? So when you say government, you know, you must not reduce everything to the federal government. We have three tiers of government. So if you have uh, federal government sponsoring uh, people to go, uh, that are government officials, then you have uh, s uh, state governments. Let you, how, many governments how many state governments are, are being threatened, have, are, in, are from states that are threatened by climate change here in Nigeria? There are so many. Apart from the border states, yeah, that the states that border the Sahara, you have states that are affected by flooding, you can have we, coastal we, states, we, you have literal we, states. Can we go so back how to many? the issue of the Dubai visa? You need to investigate to find out how many, how many of those states, how many of those states spon sponsored people out of the 400? It's part of our reporting almost on a daily basis, but mm. if we go back to the visa issue, you said there is a process. Is there a time frame or is it indefinite? It's something that's being worked on. 
and it changes, and when the changes were pragmatic. So probably before the end of this administration? Well, certainly before the end of this administration. I don't think either side wants to wait another uh, three, four years before this issue is, uh, is but resolved. But it's not somewhere near in it's somewhere a couple near. of weeks. It's somewhere near. I cannot tell you whether it's weeks or, or months. I, I, I'm not in a position to do that. Why is Nigeria a bit quiet compared to, say, South Africa over the Israeli-Palestine issue? So many, I mean, is it eight? Quiet. Yes, because Quiet. Nigeria I was, I, I was one of the appear. seven. I was one of the seven uh, ministers of foreign affairs that were going to world capitals, meeting with leaders, okay, trying to compel them to stand by a ceasefire and a peace conference to resolve the Israeli-Palestinian uh, conflict uh, to bring about uh, the, to implement the two-state. Solution. So w tell me if the South African foreign minister was one of those seven. I was, I was one of them. No, the South Africa did much more than that. It recalled its ambassador. It also sent the Israeli ambassador back home. So it's taken more proactive, publicly viewed stance. And Nigeria seemed... I, mean, I, w I, I was there now, with, the, with the foreign minister of Saudi Arabia, much. with the Palestinian uh, organizations, uh, authorities... Uh, foreign minister with the foreign minister of Egypt, with the foreign minister of Jordan, foreign minister of uh, Indonesia. We were the ones that were going around. So it's, it, it's not just about making pronouncements or withdrawing your, your ambassador. That is not where the work is. The work is in negotiations and seeking for results. So we have to, let's, let's separate uh, these things. It's not just, you see, the, again, you're going back to uh, this selfie diplomacy. That's not what this is all about. Diplomacy is about negotiations. Diplomacy is about uh, convincing people uh, to see your viewpoint and implement measures. So how do you see it. the Nigerian point of view? this shuttle diplomacy that you said you've done, how do you see it succeeding when We're a country like others. U.S., a country like U.S. can just sit and veto whatever decision the majority or all other countries have taken at the U.N.? Well, these things are gradual. It does not happen overnight. Don't forget that it was the, the only country that vetoed in the United Na uh, Nations Security uh, Council was... Uh, the U.S. In fact, for the first time maybe in a long while, even the United Kingdom did not vote along with the United States. It abstained. So, you know, we're making progress. And the United Nations Security Council is not the only platform that is being used to bring about pressure uh, on Israel to implement the ceasefire, which was succeeded, by the way, Okay, there was a ceasefire, even though they reverted to... Um, In 30 uh, seconds, can you tell me what will be the Tugar initiative in foreign policy? I mean, we had Bolaji Akinyemi's concert of medium power and what have you. What will be your... Is it that 4D you mentioned? As briefly as possible, because we've run out of time. It's 4D. It belongs to... Uh, President Bola Ahmed uh, Tinubu's administration, and it's democracy, it's development, it's demography, it's diaspora. And I can expatiate on all of these four, so it's not just a slogan. Thank you slogan. very much for putting it so succinctly. Thank Ambassador you. Ambassador Yusuf Taggar, thank you for coming on the program. Thank you for having us. Viewers, that's the end of this edition of 30 Minutes. Keep a date with us.